The scripture for the message this morning is Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. They came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. They set up false witnesses who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place will change the customs that Moses had delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat at the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. May God have his blessing to the reading of his word. The tongue is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. So says James in chapter 3, verses 8. It's not so much that the common phrase today that words have power, but it's that people don't recognize the spirit behind the words. We bind ourselves to certain ideas that seem reasonable and logical to us at the moment, and we don't see the harm of putting our trust in them, to putting our heart or spirit to connect with them. Have you noticed, for example, the prevalence of conspiracy theories these days, that there's so many that are going around. There are viewpoints that we used to think would only be useful to explain why a serial killer, for example, did the horrible things they did, and now they're becoming mainstream. And normal people who have no intention of doing anything horrible, like a serial killer, seem to be accepting these various theories. Now, internet accessibility might explain part of that, that just a touch of, uh, or a click of your mouse, you suddenly can see all of these things that most people had never heard about in the past. But I think there's something more behind it. And I think the prevalence of them in our society today shows that people's hearts are just not close to God. People are attaching their hearts to other things rather than turning to God. Life is always changing and our God is a living God. He shows us how to remain uh, stable, have a constancy in our life in the midst of those changes no matter what outward changes occur. We trust in Him and we find a stability within the ever-changing streams of life. But if we don't look to the Lord, instead, on the one hand, we may veer off to the left and say things like, change isn't happening fast enough. Something is hindering this needed change. Or we may veer off to the right and say, this change is wrong. Something evil is bringing about this change. And so, if we veer long enough, whether to the left or whether to the right, these views get hardened, and that's where I think we get these conspiracy theories. Within a group of like-minded people, these ideas can actually seem to make sense. And yet, if we hold to them long enough, we're blinded to the fact that we lack a trust in the Lord, that these ideas will betray Above all of this confusion, the living God continues to say today in the words of Isaiah, I am the Lord, there is no other. Only by trusting in the true God can we find the stability no matter what changes occur. This is what I think our text is lifting up for us as Stephen is carrying out his ministry within an environment where people are reacting in very strong ways to change. Stephen, as we're told, is full of grace and power, and he was doing great wonders and signs among the people. 
that is, the risen Jesus was working through him to do those signs and wonders in order to show that the long-awaited Messiah that people have been waiting for generation after generation after generation had finally come. And yet the very people he came to willingly turned him over to the Gentiles in order to be killed. And yet God had raised that one from the dead. Now all of this is just too much for a lot of people in Jerusalem in that day. They'd spent their lives hearing that they had to wait for a Messiah. It affected how they worship. It affected their day-to-day -day practices. So how can you say that he's already come and we didn't even recognize him? So a group of rises. A synagogue of free men and people from Africa and from Asia that had come now and lived in Jerusalem, they all came together and disputed what Stephen said. But because Stephen isn't trusting in himself, not only his actions with the signs and wonders, but also his words are from God as well. And so we're told that this group was not strong to overcome what he was saying by wisdom and by the Spirit. Now, instead of listening to what God was saying through Stephen, what does this group do? So they can't argue with him and win an argument, so they instigate a men to say, we have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Their hearts hardened even further, and they instigated people to make up something, to lie. Now these words and these lies, it said, and the spirit behind them, stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. The word stirred up is literally moved together as if those words or the spirit behind them moved together a big group of people, including all the leaders, the scribes and the elders. In other words, a conspiracy and a conspiracy theory was forming. They seized Stephen. They dragged him in before their council and they brought forward false witnesses. This man is not ceasing from speaking words against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him saying that this Jesus, the Nazarene, will destroy this place, change the customs of Moses, which, he had handed, which Moses had handed down to us. There's the key phrase in there, change our customs. This uh, Stephen is talking about a Jesus who's changing our customs. This is wrong. This is evil is what they're thinking. It has to be wrong. How could, for example, they might be saying, how could there ever come a day when people wouldn't come to the temple in Jerusalem in order to worship? Or someone else might say, how we followed Moses for over a thousand years, how can we do anything different from that now? It's just like it was too much for them to try to conceive of this. Now, yes, Israel had been following Moses for over a thousand years, but there had been changes in their daily life and, and even their worship and where they worship. It made a difference whether Israel was an independent nation or whether they got destroyed by Babylon or whether they returned and then were ruled by other countries, including Rome, who was ruling them at the time Stephen is talking here. It seemed that there was changes all along, but in these people's eyes, it's all monolithic. It's like we were always doing this, always the same way, and now these new people are coming around, the Christians, and are telling us to change all of this. They had turned their present practices into idols. They were trusting in how we've always done things instead of trusting in God the living God. No matter what conspiracy this group cooks up about Stephen, God will still always say through him, I am the Lord. There is no other. Now in the next weeks we'll pick up the details of what God said through Stephen and then how that group reacts to him. But here is just simply enough to note the peace and stability that we see in Stephen because he's uh, adhering to God and the chaotic and the underhandedness of this group because they're trusting in their own ways instead of trusting in God. 
both then and now, life is always changing. We can trust God, who will guide us through the midst of those changes, or we can trust ourselves to either, on the one hand, try to bring about needed change more quickly, or on the other hand, to stop evil, wrong change from occurring. Only following God can give us stability within the changes of life. Let's hear about a man named Bud Welch. Bud didn't hold to any conspiracy theories, but his life was greatly affected by someone who did. That man was Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma City bomber. Timothy had listened to theories that said America is becoming more and more in the hands of evil forces. And as if to say, look at all of these bad changes occurring in our country compared to the good old days and the way things used to be. And then there occurred a raid in Waco, Texas on that cult uh, with the Branch Davidians uh, that federal agents brought out. That was the last straw for Timothy McVeigh. America's government has become evil, and so he bombed the Oklahoma City Federal Building in order to show his displeasure with the evil government and draw attention to how bad it was. Now Bud Welch had a daughter, Julie, who worked in that building. She was 23 years old, 103 pounds, five foot tall, but Bud said she had a big heart. She lived her faith every day. She spent her free time helping the needy. She taught Sunday school. She volunteered for Habitat for Humanity. Every Wednesday, Bud met Julie at the, for lunch at the restaurant across the street from the building where she worked. And often she would stop by his Texaco station that he ran after work for a few minutes just to say hi to him. On a Monday, two days before the bombing, instead of a few minutes at the Texaco station, Julie stayed for two hours. And when she left, she gave him a long hug as if she didn't want to let go. And but I just thought that's unusual at the time. Then two days later on Wednesday, she, he got a call, and the call wasn't Julie asking for his lunch order so it would be ready for them when they got there. Instead, it was his, bro his brother Frank. There's been an explosion downtown. Bud turned on the TV, and the front half of Julie's building was destroyed. I scarcely breathed. My world stopped at that moment. He sat by the phone doing a vigil for two days because he kept telling himself that Julie's going to call any minute to reassure me that she's okay and wasn't a part of that. Finally, though, no call, he went to the site. He found out through some officers that though her office was in the back and some of that part of the building was still standing exactly at 9 a.m. when the bomb went off, she had gone to the front to meet two clients and bring them to the back. The day after Bud went there, they found the three bodies. They were just a few feet from the area where they would have been safe in the back part of the building. On hearing that it was a bomb that did all of this, Bud said, I survived on hate. The next few months were quite a blur in the midst of that hate, and the main thing he wanted to do was press for Timothy McVeigh's execution. But there was one small event he said that he could remember clearly in the midst of the blur. He said he was watching TV again, always wanting to know the latest news on everything related to this, and suddenly the announcer said, cameraman in Buffalo today caught a rare shot of Timothy McVeigh's father. And Bud got up thinking, I don't want to see the man. And he started to turn the TV off, but before he could reach the knob, instead, the man who had been bending over working in a garden uh, looked up, and the camera caught a glimpse of him. Bud said it was only a glimpse of his face, but in that instant, I saw a depth of pain like, like mine. Dear God, Bud thought, this man has lost a child, too. After many months had dragged by, Bud got to a place where he realized that even if Timothy Faye was killed, 
that that would end the pain that he was feeling. The question was, what would he do with this pain now? He said, half out loud, Julie, you wouldn't know me now. Angry and bitter. Hate cutting me off from Julie's way of love. Cutting me off from Julie herself. Was he obsessing over a wrong that was done? Isn't that what the bomber was doing? but decided to quit publicly agitating for his execution. Over time, others heard about this change of heart, and there started to become requests for speaking. Uh, different groups wanted him to speak about his change of heart. Three years after the bombing, there was a call from a nun in Buffalo, New York. And as he received the call, he's thinking, Buffalo, why does that sound so familiar? And then he remembered that that little news uh, bit that he had seen years before. And Bud surprised himself when he asked the nun if she could somehow set up a meeting with McVeigh's father. It was set up and eventually he found himself at his front door and open and they kind of looked at each other awkwardly and eventually Bud said, I hear you have a garden. I grew up on a farm. So they both walked around the house and went to the back where the garden was and, and they talked gardening for about a half hour. Then they went into the kitchen from the back door. Lots of family photos up on the walls and there was a young man's picture there. Bill, who was the father, said it's Tim's high school graduation picture. Gosh, what a handsome kid, Bud said. The words were out before I could stop them any more than his father could stop the tears from filling his eyes. A young daughter, Jennifer, 24, came down to talk with them, just a little bit younger than his Julie. She had just started her first job as an elementary school teacher, and yet when a lot of the parents found out her last name, they were threatening to take their children out of the class. Bill had worked at a GM plant for 36 years, and always tried to do good by his family. Bud stayed for two whole hours. When I got up to leave, he said, Jennifer hugged me, just like Julie always had. We held each other tight. Both of us cried. I never felt so close to God as I did at that moment. We're in this together, I told them. We can't change the past but we have a choice about the future. And months later, his reflection on this was, it was the seed of care that Julie had left behind for him. One person reaching out to another. It's a seed that could be planted wherever the cycle of hate leaves an open wound in God's world. Now there's many cycles of hate that are trying to leave wounds in our world today. Theories about either stopping some evil change or bringing and forcing in some needed change, but the spirit behind them all would get them to trust in ourselves and not get us to trust in the living God. There is a better way. We can trust the true God who will guide us through all the changes of life. Only He can give us constancy and the stability that we need through these changes. Above all the conflict of those trying to sow hate today, God is still saying again in those words of Isaiah, 